Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this is part three of the Gilded Age uh, Politics uh, recorded lecture. And so we're going to start out talking about the last decade of the Gilded Age, and that's the 1890s. And so we ended the part two talking about the populist part. I'm going to talk about the populist more in uh, this part as well, because really the populists begin with kind of begin. They begin with the, the Grange movement, which at the state level. And this, the Grange was a lot of social gatherings, but pulling farmers' resources together um, to help purchase grain elevators together or, or farmers' co-ops and, and so forth. Um, the Farmers' Alliance sprung out of the Grange and, and expanded to the state level. And the Farmers' Alliance uh, was more political than social, which was the opposite of the Grange. And eventually the Farmers' Alliance came together and formed uh, the Populist Party from the combining of Farmers' Alliance groups in various states. So before we get to that, though, let's uh, look at the election of 1892. And so really this, this populism was a, was a catalyst for political crisis, not only in the South, but across the entire nation. The election of 1888, where Benjamin Harrison beat Grover Cleveland, who received more popular votes, was the last close election of the era. Thereafter, the tide turned against the Republicans, saddled, saddled by the lackluster Harris administration and by Democratic charges. The protectionist McKinley Tariff of 1890 was a giveaway to business interest. In the 1880s, tariffs became a hot topic because high tariffs were resulting in unnecessarily high prices on manufactured goods, which hurts a lot of Americans. Um, and so it hurt both farmers and consumers while protecting several wealthy manufacturers. So they felt like it was protecting the, the elite and not protecting the average American. So in 1890, the Democrats took the House of Representatives decisively and won a number of governorships in normally Republican states. In 1892, Cleveland regained the presidency by the largest margin in 20 years. So also the election of 1892 is the first election that the populist candidate uh, ran. And if you look at, at um, James B. Weaver, he won Kansas, uh, won Colorado, one Nevada, one, one electoral vote in Oregon, one Idaho, and one electoral vote in North Dakota. That was revolutionary uh, for a third party. So a third party had never really done that good uh, in American history um, since the Republican Party started. So the problem is for Cleveland is he walked into the wrong situation at the wrong time. Uh, the election or the uh, panic of 1893 was the Great Depression. I've mentioned this in a few lectures. Now, um, it's bad. It's, it's only four years bad uh, as opposed to the Great Depression, which is much longer. It happens in the 1930s. So um, debtors were up to their necks in debt. Um, and I mentioned this previously, but it was caused by overbuilding, speculation, labor disorders, and the ongoing agricultural depression. Also, people push for unlimited coinage of silver, particularly the populist. Um, Free silver agitation also damaged American credit abroad, so it kind of hurt our, our international standing. And the usual pinch on American finances to come when European banking houses began to call on loans from the United States. Around 8,000 American businesses collapsed in six months, and many unemployed had to resort to soup kitchens, and many homeless roamed about the country. In Chicago alone, 100,000 jobless workers walked the streets, and nationwide, the unemployment rate soared above 20%. Um, so. That's almost as bad as the Great Depression, which was at least 25 percent and some places as high as 50 percent um, during the Great Depression. But the Great Depression um, was a little bit deeper and much longer in length. Now, Cleveland was forced to use much of the country's gold storage to purchase silver. Uh, Cleveland then decided to encourage Congress to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 because it kind of led to inflation. The Treasury sunk down to forty one million dollars in gold. And what's crazy is Cleveland, okay, he turned to the great American banking financier, J.P. Morgan, uh, to for a gold loan. Okay, check this out. The federal government had to take a loan from a private citizen. That's how much money J.P. Morgan had or at least control with his investment banking. And you look, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank is still around. That shows you what kind of... Uh, kind of great bank that J.P. Morgan helped establish. So what he did is he did give the United States a $65 billion loan in gold, but he's charged about a $7 million interest um, and what, what, when it was all paid back. So uh, Morgan's not in the business of losing money. This loan did help the nation's finances for a bit. Cleveland gets really criticized for going to deal with big business 
Um, and so Morgan, it was called the banker's banker. Um, and they, they referred to Cleveland as Morgan's errand boy. Um, but you got to realize that he didn't really have a whole lot of choice. We were, our currency got that shortage on gold uh, because we had focused on silver for, for a certain number of years with the Sherman, Anti, or, or Sherman Silver Purchase Act. Um, C- Cleveland also encouraged the passing of the Will- Wilson-Gorman tariff in 1894 that had so many special interest protection things in it that it barely made a dent in the high McKinley tariff rates. He allowed to pass without a signature, and the same tariff problems that had plagued the Republicans in the past presidential term now did the same for the Democrats, who lost many seats in Congress in the election of 1894. Uh, Cleveland was a- unable to cope with serious economic crisis that befell the country in 1893, and typically, uh, let's share James Monroe in American history. If there is a bad depression during your, your time in office, you're done uh, the next election. So um, one of the things, like many depressions, is it's a domino effect. It's not one single cause. It's, it's several things that kind of happen at the same time that, that set off the ripple effect. And that's what you have um, with the Panic of 1893. So. Unemployment reached about 3 million, uh, which is terrible, um, but the population was much smaller then, so it was about uh, 20%. And uh, the government continued its laissez-faire policies despite um, crying out for the American uh, for the American people. And um, so what's going to end up happening is Cleveland is still forced to buy silver, and he takes out a loan from um, J.P. Morgan. Okay. And one of the things J.P. Morgan also done in the decade is he bought out Carnegie Steel and uh, created the first billion dollar corporation with U.S. Steel and uh, so forth. So um, here's James Pierpont Morgan, one of the few pictures of him. Um, he had a, a skin problem on his nose. And so this image has actually been doctored up because he he, he, uh, um, he hated people taking his uh, picture. He actually was was actually pretty private and rather shy in public, um, which is kind of hard to one of the most, he was probably the most fun, you know, powerful banking man in American history. Um, so here's a political cartoon to illustrate the times, interest bearing bond, um, strapping down labor, their debt, uh, road to pauperism. So poverty and so forth. And talking about the panic of 1893. Um, this is an interesting, a little poem from a par, uh, far, from a farmer, which I thought was kind of fascinating for the day. When the banker says he's broke and the merchant's up in smoke, they forget it's the farmer who feeds them all. It would put them to the test that the farmer took a rest, that they know that it's the farmer feeds them all. Okay. So uh, populism um, won um, in the, some midterm elections in 1894 and 1896 um, at the, in the House of Representatives and the Senate because of uh, the Panic of 1890. So the populace, you know, vote increased by 40 percent in the election of 1894. Um, and so Democrats lost big time in the West because whoever parties in power typically gets paint, blamed for a depression, whether it's their fault or not. Um, so let's look at the free silver issue. So um, the election of 1896 and election of 1900, um, silver is, is really the big issue. Now, in the election of 1900, it could have been imperialism. Um, and chances are the Democrats could have won in 1900 if they would have made um, anti-imperialism their their main party platform. But instead, they they picked silver. Um, and so one of the things that happened, um, the Bland-Allison Act of 1878 required the government to purchase silver. This was done after the Comstock Law was discovered in 1859 and, and um, um, out in western Nevada. And then the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 required the government to purchase more silver. Now, the reason why they did this is because of pressure from the farmers uh, politically who wanted more uh, silver in the economy. But they didn't realize the effects of that would be is it leads to inflation because silver is worth less than gold. And in their minds, they increase the currency supply. Their crops going to get more uh, price at the market and therefore they can pay back their, their farming debts uh, much easier. But what they don't realize is it drives up the cost of everything. So um, that's, that's kind of interesting. One of the things that, uh, that happens with the populist party is the populists believe that, that on one side stood the monopolies, uh, the money, power, the great trust, and the railroad corporations, while the other side consists of farmers, laborers, merchants, and all those who wanted to produce wealth. Populists sought the support of labor unions as well as farmers. 
Texas railroad workers and Colorado miners cooperated with the Farmers Alliance and got their support in strikes and actively participated in forming state populist parties. Samuel Gompers lost part of the AFL to the populists. Uh, he was one of the most famous labor leaders in American history and founder and leader of the American Federation of Labor, which is still around today. Radical reformer Henry uh, Demarest Lloyd envisioned a, farm, a farmer labor movement that would win, the U uh, win in the U.S. Originally, the populists abandoned the two major parties, but um, the populists eventually joined forces with the Democrats. Uh, the populists did call for nationalization of the railroads and communications, which is socialism, protection of the land, including natural resources, uh, particularly from, uh, they also wanted protection from monopoly and foreign ownership. They also wanted a graduate income tax, which the um, progressive era does establish in the early 1900s, and then free unlimited coins of silver. Uh, but this free silver movement really became the big issue and ends up being the one that uh, they kind of fall on their own sword. So tariffs protected industrialists, but did nothing for farmers. So if I was a farmer from, say, South Dakota, and I'm a, I'm a grower of grain, well, at this time, some of the biggest grain competition internationally was Russia uh, and Argentina. And so my, my wheat is not uh, not protected on uh, the international markets. But if I was a factory owner that manufactured farm equipment, American tariffs would protect them. So the farmer can't get the cheapest farm equipment because tariffs make British farm equipment more expensive. OK, so and the farmer's eyes, well, let's just lower the tariff and make for the best prices for anybody. I should better get the cheapest farm equipment I can get. Um, while industrials are like, no, we need to protect American business. We can hire more workers and so forth. Um, and so they didn't like, farmers did not like the tariffs. Okay. Also, far farmers wanted um, unlimited coins of silver. As I mentioned earlier, they thought it would increase the, the money supply and allow them to pay back their debts quicker. Okay. So gold bugs um, who wanted, um, didn't want silver in the currency. They wanted gold because it's worth more. Okay. So money was worth more than uh, what it would be with, with silver. Okay. Now, um, one of the things too that the farmers didn't like about Rhodes, and the reason why they wanted the federal government to take it over is, and, and Teddy, Rose, excuse me, Teddy Roosevelt is going to regulate the railroads when he comes into office in the early 1900s in the progressive era. But um, it basically, like if you were in North Dakota, there may only be one rail line that comes through. Well, you got to pay whatever price they, they charge for you to ship your grain. It is what it is. Northern Securities primarily was the one that controlled that. Um, and so farmers oftentimes had to go in debt to buy supplies, and then they got charged high interest from the suppliers at the stores. Um, and so they really felt like they were getting exploited, um, both with the tariffs and, and with the debt. Okay. Now, one guy that uh, decides to um, march on Washington um, is a guy named Jacob Coxey. And so um, his name is Jacob S. Coxey, and he urged Washington to relieve unemployment by an inflationary public works program. Supported by some 500 million in legal tender notes to be issued by the Treasury, it was ended when he and his followers marched into Washington and were arrested for walking on the grass, which I thought was funny. Democrats and other labor organizers were further angered when President Grover Cleveland, when he handled the Pullman strike harshly, uh, and he also allowed the Wilson Gorman tariff of 1894 to go into law without a signature and persuaded Congress in 1893 to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. He was a sound currency guy. So Coxie promised to have a, um, a million man march on Washington and uh, doesn't happen. Um, he doesn't. Well, it does happen, but there's not a million people. He ends up getting arrested and ends up kind of looking some like a fool. But what Coxie's army showed is that the, the government was out of touch with the common man. And uh, that's going to be an issue that the progressive era is going to take up and uh, where the con man feels like he has more of a voice. OK, um, here is Coxie riding instead of marching. 20,000 showed up. And so. Here's William Jennings Bryan walking on a beach full of uh, uh, silver. We'll talk about him now. William Jenks Bryan is one of the more famous politicians of American history because he runs for um, the presidency three different times in American history. He loses uh, all three. Um, he was also the youngest presidential candidate we've had of a major party. He, he actually gets nominated at, at the age of 36. 
he's going to run in the election of 1896, election 1900, and then 1908. And then um, he ends up uh, dying right after the Scopes trial, uh, most likely an aneurysm. In 1925, so um, we will talk about him through uh, through a couple of modules. But great orator, one of the great public speakers uh, of his day and age, and probably one of the hardest working campaigners in American history. Um, William James Bryan made a lot of things, but Lazy was not one of them. And um, but he really made silver the central issue, and that's going to be his political downfall. Um, it just wasn't sound economics, and so forth. Um, so it, it is what it is, but let's look at, um, let's look at his, his campaign and his famous cross of gold speech. Um, so he, he gave a speech before the democratic convention in 1896. And what the reason why it's called the cross of gold speech is he says, you will not crucify me on a cross of gold, um, saying that, uh, that gold currency is exploiting the average American. That's, that's basically his argument. Um, and that the real businessmen did not, um, or excuse me, the, the elite businessmen were not really like the uh, real businessmen of farmers, agricultural workers, miners, and small town merchants. Um, he basically was an advocate of the common man and farmers and, and the wage earner versus big business and other middle class interests. Okay. Now, um, here is uh, an excerpt from his speech. They tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that our great cities rest upon our broad and great prairies. Burn down your cities, leave our farms, and your cities will, uh, will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city of the country. You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind, mankind upon a cross of gold. And so they made several political cartoons about it and so forth. And the populace joined forces with the Democrats. Now, Brian was from Nebraska. And so this is a political cartoon of him carrying that uh, crown of thorns and then that cross of gold and so forth. So it was an incredible speech and one of the more popular speeches of the century. And um, he he does win the nomination. Um, so he made 18,000 miles of travel. And what he did is he would um, uh, speak uh, after every um, on every stop at the back of a train to anybody that would listen. Now, this one's making fun of Brian, saying he's 16 to one um, odds of winning, and, and he doesn't really win. Um, and so this is making fun of the Democratic Party being taken over by the populace and the silver people and so forth. This is a pro-Republican political cartoon there, as you can tell. Now, the Republicans go with... Um, Kind of a for, somewhat of a forgotten American president, but he's really not forgotten because of his assassination. But William McKinley, he's kind of an underrated president. Not a bad guy, just a kind of a, a simple guy from um, governor of Ohio. And uh, what's interesting about his election of 1896 and then his reelection in 1900 is he really didn't campaign. Um, there was a congressman by the name of Mark Hanna, who was the leader of the Republican Party at that time. And what he was was able to do is to fundraise as well as any party part person in American history. And he was able to fundraise millions of dollars, basically, from people like John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan and others. And they were able to campaign on McKinley's behalf. McKinley stayed in, in Ohio just chilling. And so um, they kind of exposed the Democrats on the issue of silver. Um, and how that would be bad economically. And um, he and he was the last Civil War veteran to serve in the White House. Um, and he did support the gold standard, like a lot of the, the Eastern bankers and industrialists and so forth. But a lot of middle class Americans supported um, gold. Now, this is Mark Hanna on the left. This is an uh, exaggerated image of him. And he says uh, that uh, that man, Clay, uh, was an ass. It's better to be president than to be right. And so this one's a critical of McKinley and Mark Hanna. He didn't quite look like that. He had money bag ear lobes, you can see there, but, uh, and so forth. And this is um, about gold and silver. Um, and this is uh, kind of talking about way McKinley was this, you couldn't straddle both gold and silver. Here's the one that's pro McKinley. McKinley was serving as a soldier during the American Civil War while William James Bryan was just in the crib. Okay. And so this is a political cartoon about which is going to, um, who's going to win. 
Republican Party builders of corporate wealth, the People's Party builders of churches and school, and the Democratic Party builders of saloons and jails. So obviously it's pro-populist, okay? Election of 1896, close election for the most part. Um, it's basically about 600,000 votes or so that, that separates uh, McKinley and um, Bryan. It's not as close to the election of 1888. That's the closest um, presidential election we'll have for some time. Um, but you can see that the Democrats win a, looks. Uh, if you look at it on the map, it looks like a bigger part of the country. But because the northern states controlled um, so much uh, more people, they had more electoral votes and therefore they won. Now, remember I told you typically in the Guild Age, whoever wins New York wins the election. New York had the most electoral votes and uh, McKinley won New York. That was, that was significant there. So you look at the populist advance in these states out west, the populists are very, very popular in the western states, except for California. Uh, now, you do have some territories that aren't voting yet, and they're not as very popular in Montana, uh, mainly because Montana is a big ranching state, not as big of a farming state. Um, if it was a more of a farming state, um, then you would it'd be a little bit different. Montana did have farms, don't be wrong, but it's also known for a lot of ranches at that time for the cattle industry. So McKinley defeats Bryant in the election of 1896, and uh, 1900, they end up passing the Gold Standard Act, which basically said, all right, we're going to commit to gold going forward, and um, this is gold triumphing over silver and like the gladiator game and so forth. So why did Bryant lose? Well, he put made silver the issue. Um, he, should, he did not bridge the gap to urban voters. He should not have uh, made silver the issue, according to historians. Um, some some industrialists told their workers if, if Brian wins on on the election day on Monday, don't show to work on Tuesday. Um, he did not form alliances with other groups, and the McKinley uh, campaign. Even though McKinley stayed home and and campaigned from Ohio, um, it was very well organized and, and highly funded. Where Brian just thought if he spoke to as many people as possible, he's going to win. That's that's not going to be the case. So oh, populism ends up declining. Um, the reason why is they thought it was too radical. The socialistic aspect of populism out the door. The more moderate form of populism is going to be adopted by the progressives, as we'll see in module two. And um, also race divide the populist party. Look, for instance, Southern populists didn't want African-Americans. If the Southern populists would have brought in the African-American vote, then they might have won the election. Um, and they weren't able to appeal to the traditional party voters. And so now eventually, um, Brian could have made imperialism the issue and the election of 1900s, we'll get to the American expansion um, part and, and lecture in uh, module two, but unfortunately he still makes free silver the issue. And so this is Brian locked out of the White House and this is Brian giving his famous cross of gold speech. Now, most people don't know this, but The Wizard of Oz uh, was actually about populism. Okay, so let me show you. All right. Let me go over this real quick with you. So who are the characters in the Wizard of Oz, which is kind of cool. So the Cowardly Lion was supposed to be Wayne Jennings Bryan. Okay. Um, and it's based on a book and then later made into a fa famous movie. It's one of the most famous movies in American history. But the Tin Woodsman was supposed to be the Eastern Industrial Worker. All right. So dealing with, with metal. The um, Scarecrow is um, the farmer. You have scarecrows on farms and what, so forth. The Wicked Witch of the East was the bankers. Um, Wicked Witch of the West, we don't really know for the book. Dorothy and her silver slippers were supposed to be the silver standard. The yellow bicker was the gold standard. And the Wizard of Oz was President William McKinley. And then Toto didn't have any significance and so forth. Um, so it's actually about populism, believe it or not.